Encounter is brought to you by the Broome County Council of Churches, where we connect compassion with needs as we inspire growth with dignity. You'll find us in special places throughout the community. For those who remain hungry, we provide meals. For those who are challenged, we build wheelchair ramps. We comfort those who are ill, minister to those who are confined, and we remain an advocate for change and understanding on behalf of every element of our community. Connect and inspire. Encounter the Broome County Council of Churches. Brothers and sisters, welcome to the Encounter program sponsored by the Broome County Council of Churches. I'm your host, Mark Kimpland, the pastor at the Endwell United Methodist Church. The Encounter program, uh, our purpose, our mission, our vision is to inspire and inform Broome County and, and neighboring counties of all the wonderful work people are doing in this area, whether they be nonprofits, whether they be religious organizations, civic orga organizations, but just to connect and inspire people who are making a difference in our community. And we have one such group of people with us this morning that I can't wait to start uh, this interview. Uh, we have with us uh, two folks from the Food Bank of the Southern Tier. I'd like to introduce them. Uh, first, Randy Quackenbush, who is the Director of Community Impact, and also Kathleen Passetti, who is the Programs and Partner Coordinator for both Broome and Tompkins County. Uh, Randy and Kathleen, welcome. I am so glad we made this happen. <laughs> Thanks so, for having us. Absolutely. Well, let's get right to it. Um, first, why don't we just start with a little intro for each of you as to, uh, I gave you the title, uh, but maybe you might want to flush that out a little bit, uh, and maybe your involvement with uh, uh, the Food Bank and, and a little bio about that, if you would. Randy, would you, would you start uh, on that? Sure. Um, so again, my name is Randy Quackenbush. I'm the Director of Community Impact with the Food Bank. I'm coming up on my eighth year anniversary at the Food Bank. And the role of the Community Impact Department is working with all of our program and agency partners in the, our six county service area, as well as our advocacy and education programs. And we also have a data and evaluation function within our department. Awesome. Great. Kathleen. Well, as you said, I'm Program Partnership Coordinator. I cover Broom and Tompkins. And one piece of my job is to support, um, let's say, existing relationships and build new ones where we spot opportunities. So I get to help cut through the isolation. Some people talk about it as siloed work mm -hmm. um, to like learn where folks are thinking they have to come up with solutions by themselves but offer the backing of the food bank and of the nearby pantry or meal site. So like my customers are the frontline workers. So they're mostly volunteers whose guests or customers or clients are the community members that they serve. Um, uh, can I give a couple examples? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So like I concentrate on who is um, looking out for one another and teaming up with neighbors together. So that way of being, I can think of Mary Lou and Taryn and Alice at Trinity's uh, walk-up pantry. They really embody this in their work. And um, in, an, in one of your previous interviews, you were talking with um, the folks, the retired pastors of Hands-On Ministry, and you mentioned how responsive Broom is to people's needs. And I've only been at the food bank since January, so I'm at month oh, nine. Okay. And um, I completely agree with what you said. I, I, I've really been seeing that. It's really been striking. And um, it's really what the food bank and Chow and 211, like that we're all here to support that frontline work that meal sites and pantries are doing in schools, you know, to get food distributed to all. Um, I want to do a shout out to uh, who you know well, um, but in terms of re that responsiveness, um, so Dave and his team at the United Methodist Church in Enwell. So they run the Lord's Table, um, Lord's Table Community Meal and that the drive-through that they've partnered with us in terms of that drive-through mobile food pantry. Uh, and they deliver food to many, many families and individuals who can't make it out there. And I know because you're, you know, you're there loading the food as well. But just this past week, we got a call from a couple whose health conditions really make it impossible for them to go to the mobile and they wanted to attend the upcoming one. So um, someone at the food bank called Dave and he said, you know, it's 15 miles away. And he said, absolutely. He didn't even hesitate to say, well, of course we'll deliver. So like in my work, I'm looking out for um, the folks who are looking out for one another. And if I'm lucky enough, if I'm doing it right and I hear the stories 
of people doing it well. I get to connect them with one another because there is so much happening that folks don't always know what's happening across the street or how they can, like, let's say a pantry is trying to figure out delivery. Well, here's one over here that's got that model that they're working on. Let's scheme together about how to adapt that for your church's pantry setup. So that's a big piece of my job is, is being responsive to the frontline workers. Yeah. Um, who are then re- trying to be super responsive to um, the level of food insecurity in Broome. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I, well, and on behalf of um, this community, I thank you both for, for all that you do to, to pull that off because there's a lot of spinning plates. Um, one of the things that I've always been impressed with, I've been in the area now going on my ninth year, just so impressed with all of those plates um, that uh, of cooperation and, and creating that synergy because that's not – what happens in a lot of areas. Um, I've been in different uh, ministries in different areas of New York State, and I was just astounded when I came to Broome County. Mm -hmm. Uh, But still, one of the things that we always have to to be aware of is, even though there are many great things, it's still, and I'm sure you would agree, it's always a constant um, importance to get the word out, to to, to make sure that everybody knows. So how would you... Can you just kind of summarize your work? Um, Someone hears uh, uh, the Food Bank of the Southern Tier. For some, that's just verbiage. For some, it's something very intimate. How would you describe your work and its purpose and its mission and such things? Sure, I'm I'm happy to kick off that answer. Um, so the Food Bank of the Southern Tier, we've been in operation, we're coming up on our 40th anniversary, and our mission is working together to build and sustain hunger-free communities throughout the Southern Tier. And we do that in partnership with with a lot of the folks that Kathleen mentioned. You know, the food bank is one building. We are headquartered in Elmira, but we cover six counties. We cover Broome, Shemong, Tompkins, Tioga, Schuyler, and Steuben. And within those our six counties, we work with over 300 partners who actually help us to move the food. Uh, so we're part of the Feeding America network. Feeding America is our national umbrella organization that includes over 200 food banks across the country. Every county in the U.S. is served by a different food bank, and we work in collaboration to source donations nationally. And then we also obviously have a lot of local donations, so we do retail pickups from grocery stores. We work with a lot of local farmers. We actually purchase some local produce. We get uh, a fair amount of our food comes through the USDA, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, through a program called the Emergency Food Assistance Program. And we also actually purchase some wholesale foods because we can't always rely on donations to ensure that we have staples. So that's kind of the, the big food bank structure. And then, yeah, within our six counties, we have 400 or 4,000, I'm sorry, square miles that we work in, which seems pretty big, but there's some food banks that cover whole states. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so it's kind of just the the basics of how the food bank operates. Yeah, Kathleen, anything you want to, you want to add to that? No, oh, thank okay. so. okay. Thank you. Well, I I I appreciate that. That uh, that is very helpful. I think for those that know a lot about the food bank and those that might be tuning in uh, this uh, today and and just have heard it. So, uh, but friends, we are, I, I'm thrilled to have uh, with us this morning as guests, uh, both Randy Quackenbush and also Kathleen Pacetti from the Food Bank of the Southern Tier. I guess my next question is this, um, in case you didn't know, um, we've been 18 months in a pandemic. <laughs> uh, how has that changed? Uh, what it is you folks do? I, uh, I, I, I'm sure we all could write books right now uh, about our experiences uh, in, in, in those things that we do. Um, what, uh, Kathleen, what, what, what's changed in, in, in your role or in, in the role of the food bank over the last 18 months and how have you adapted? I'm going to toss that back to Randy, given that I've, I, and then I might add something afterwards, Absolutely. given that she's been there for all Absolutely. of it. Yeah. That Thank sounds you. great. That sounds great. Yeah, I I mean, I hate to use this word because it's been overused, but pivot <laughs> was the key theme. Uh, we, I think what was kind of you know interesting to me is we assembled our staff in the warehouse on the afternoon of Friday, March 13th. And I just remember because it was Friday the 13th. And we talked about, you know, what might happen if things shut down and who's essential, who would need to be in the building and who wouldn't. And we did have a, a bit of a plan. Um, and then we all went home that night and the first school started closing. 
And thankfully, a lot of staff took their laptops home because we said, if you are able to work from home, don't come in on Monday. So we had a, a core group of staff who were in the building and, and then folks started working remotely. And then we just went into kind of two weeks of not chaos, but almost approaching chaos and that nobody really knew what was happening. The schools were being closed. We didn't understand how COVID was being spread. And we, we knew we had to figure out a new model of contactless distribution. So we had to make the really hard decision to suspend our current mobile food pantry model, which we call a walk-up model, where we have a truck and people come up and walk around the truck and they shop, because we just knew people weren't gonna be able to, to distance in that. So we converted all of our mobile food pantries into what we call these community food distributions. And we were serving 500 households and it took us about 13 days to pause our normal operations and to move into that model. Uh, we also knew we wouldn't be able to have a lot of people in our building in our, our production room where we have volunteers pack food. So we had to make another hard choice to actually suspend production in the building, which meant we, we couldn't have people packing boxes. And so we need boxes to be packed, but we can't do it safely in our building. So we set up five what we called offsite food hubs located around our six counties, somewhere in schools somewhere in random empty buildings um, and we had people stepped up to run those as hubs and we were packing emergency food boxes in those spaces and, and getting those boxes out through our school districts actually and our school districts just had did an amazing job over the past two years in getting an, a, a lot of food out and taking advantage of, of flexibilities and school meal options. So not only were they moving their meals, they were helping us move these, these non-perishable boxes. And then a lot of schools actually helped us move produce. So that was going on in the summer. Um, our CFDs, the, the drive-throughs, were getting a lot of media attention, but at the same time, the majority of our regular food pantries remained open. And I think that was one thing we could have done a better job at highlighting, uh, not only us, but even the, the local national media, and that most of the pantries were open and that they are staffed mostly by volunteers and also mostly by older people that were most at risk for COVID. So these folks kept showing up. They knew what a, an, an important service they were offering. So as fall progressed in, in last year, we did try to return to some sort of sense of normalcy. So we wound down those 500 household drive throughs and went back to some of our um, traditional mobile food pantry sites. We're continuing to do drive throughs which as Delta has surged, we're really glad we've kept that model up. Um, but last year, we actually distributed over 17 and a half million pounds of food, which is hard to kind of fathom how much food that is, but that was about 33% more than we had done the year before. And a lot of that was produce, which was really exciting for us because that's a big priority. We last year served about 20% more households than we normally did in 2019. And we found that a lot of people coming to those drive throughs about 40%, it was their first time that they had utilized a service like that. So not only were we trying to figure things out, a lot of people whose employment was jeopardized or their hours were cut, a lot of people were put in a position that they'd never been in and really didn't know where to turn. So we were really fortunate to have our, our partners and our sites and the people running our food hubs. You know, it was really a collective effort of thousands of people across our six counties to, to keep these services in operation in a safe way. Yeah, yeah. Kathleen, how about you? you with, with your job and such things, how has your job affected or, or the, what you were doing as you were putting together over the last 18 months? Well, so I started in January. So yeah. I will say that by the time that I arrived at the food bank, um, a lot of systems were in place okay. in yeah. terms of working remotely. Sure. Um, but sure. I do have an example of yeah. a pantry and how it's pivoted that I'd love to share now, or please, I can wait please, on that. Please, um, please. So, you know, every pantry that could figure out how to stay open or has returned to being open um, is really, it, it varies, right? The stories really vary. Um, so, one of the rural ones I want to um, highlight is Windsor Human Development. So they're at Our Lady of Lords Roman Catholic Church in Windsor. And these are tremendous volunteers working side by side with community members. So Bridget and Trevor and their team in Windsor, so they shifted their pantry to the church parking lot, right, during COVID. And now it's actually a community gathering place. Mm. So one person plays the guitar from the back of their truck. Other people um, strategize, um, they share their strategies about how they've lowered their utility bills. 
um, Bridget and Trevor were telling me how they um, set up an internet hotspot there so that folks in this rural area can inter have internet access and can have a buddy as they are accessing services online. They're staying safe and connected in this church park parking lot. So, and, and they're happy to continue with this model. It's working really well. Everyone feels safe and thought about. And it's really what we like to think of as a model of like a, of a community food center. And that's yeah. something that's come from COVID. Yeah. Yeah, m much has. I uh, yeah. just even even on a personal level uh, here at the Endwell United Methodist Church, uh, this eighteen months transforming a beautiful uh, fellowship hall that was kind of the center of everything now has pallets all over the place, <laughs> and, right. and, and 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 has boxes and bags and 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 just uh, it's it's the warehouse really of, of, of what we do right now uh, um, in in relationship with the food bank of the Southern Tier, which is. Um, which to me is exciting. Uh, it took a little while to get used to um, because uh, we, I can't even remember the last time we've had uh, anything other than that happen in our fellowship hall, but it's meeting the need and mm -hmm. uh, that they've embraced that, which is, which is phenomenal. Uh, friends, we have with us uh, on our show today, um, Randy Quackenbush, the Director of Community Impacts, and also Kathleen Pacetti, the Programs and Partnership uh, Coordinator uh, for both the, the Food Bank of the Southern Tier um, as our guests today. And one question as we were preparing for this uh, show that, that I'm glad that you included, and I'd like to ask it now, um, Again, I haven't been, I, I'm not a, a native of the Southern Tier and everything is new every day. I learn of some new agency or, or something like that. But how do you work together with Chow? How, how is that relationship? Because there's lots, there's so many of these things that are around and I often wonder how they all, how they all work together. Sure. Randy, shall I take that? Yep. Okay, great. Yep. So number one, Chow is a vital partner. Um, and the Broom Bounty's food recovery program is so key, right, in the work of sustainability and thinking about our, our planet. Um, so I had the pleasure of teaming up with Clayton and Mike and Nathaniel from Chow in, um, in August. Last, so last month, um, there was a, an event uh, at Binghamton's Night Out. Um, and that Pastor Henry Osby and the team, um, the Hands of Hope Ministry, right? They, they organized this tremendous community event. And so it was super well attended and there was giving out food was a piece of that, but a lot of other things, great things happened that night. So we, we're teamed up. Broom has the largest meal gap in, uh, in the food bank service area, but there is food enough for everyone. So between Chow's distribution, Broom Bounty, the food bank, and the many partners, um, we're, we ought to be able to get the food in everyone's, you know, hands and, yes. and, and stomachs. So we're all very motivated to eliminate this gap. We are on the same team with similar missions for sure. And we have this contractual partnership basically that makes it sort of official about how we bring our resources together. So, I mean, really the bottom line is it's a very important relationship and we work closely together, um, distributing food, some from the same sources, some from different sources. Um, and bringing it to our partners and into the community. Mm -hmm. Do you want to add anything, Randy? Um, I guess just to build off the contractual relationship, um, Chow is part of the Feeding America Network, just like we are. They're called a redistribution organization, so they're kind of like a sub-food bank for Broom County. Kathleen, you, you, you used the word um, that, that intrigued me when, when I heard it, and, and I know this might be very subjective, and if it is, please forgive me, but uh, I, I would welcome you, uh, either of, or both of your inputs. You mentioned that gap um, between what we have and what's available, and I'm thinking you're saying the gap is those that may not have access to that for whatever reason. Can you describe that gap? For, for our listeners and viewers, I'm, and I know that's subjective, you probably can't say X number of people are in this gap or anything, but can you can have, kind of give some flesh to that as to what we might be looking at? Randy, I know you can. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, we refer to what's called the meal gap frequently. It's um, data that Feeding America provides us annually. The data is a couple years old when we get it, but it's based on a, a pretty complex formula looking at food insecurity rates, poverty rates, 
um, even things like employment and home ownership, and they they compare that number to the amount of food that's distributed by the charitable food network. And um, the Broome County out of our six counties, I don't have the number right off the top of my head, but it does have that biggest gap. And what we're really working to do, and as Kathy mentioned, is we know we have all the resources there. It's that a lot of people might not know about it or the resources might not be available when people need them or they might not be in a convenient location. So we're really trying to think strategically, like we have all this food, we have all these awesome partners and amazing people working together, but something is still not you know, catching. There's something missing here. And we actually just uh, conducted a really in-depth um, study last year and we got the results in february on underserved and under-resourced populations and we found in broome county in particular there's definitely pockets of refugees and immigrants that we're not reaching so there you know there's might be a real easy solution and that it might be translation services that we don't have our materials in the language that people need and we need to find out like what are those languages and how do we get that those materials and that also has helped us think about new partnerships. So how are we working with organizations that work with those particular populations? How are we creating systems where it's much more convenient to pick up food? So we're we're thinking about, you know, if someone's already going to a library, can they get a box of food when they're dropping off their books or picking up their kids? Or if people are already, you know, attending after school programs, how do we expand our work with schools to help parents pick up food? So this the solutions are a little more complex and, uh, and um, we've kind of operated in the past out of a one size fits all model, but we've learned that that just doesn't work and it really needs to be a community level solution. It can't be a six county or even a county wide solution to meet the need. So yeah, trying to be a lot more strategic with our resources and, and having positions like Kathleen's where she really is deepening and developing relationships, not only with her partners, but she's creating relationships among partners, which is which is fabulous. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. That's that very insightful. I, I, I appreciate that. And a wonderful segue for my next question. <laughs> uh, there are those that are listening or watching this program right now uh, that have a lot of knowledge about the food bank and those that are hearing about it for the very first time. So I, I guess a twofold question, and I'll let either or both of you answer this. Uh, how, how do people get involved? Um, how do they how do they become a part of that network or on the other hand how would they uh, go about receiving assistance from the food bank okay let me sure. say a few I, things first randy yeah, and go then, ahead okay so just want to make sure i'm clear on making sure i say so if i'm working one or two jobs and i'm still behind on my rent or i'm forgoing a meal so that my kids can have a full dinner you know going to a pantry can feel, make a huge difference in my monthly food budget um and a partner uh, recently said, you know, if I, I want to come and shop for come and shop for free here before you go to the paid grocery store, and it will make a big difference in one's life. What we hear a lot is people saying, um, I can't use that resource. It's there for someone else. Well, it's actually here for everyone. And um, Julie of Our Lady of Sorrows and Vestal, she knew there were folks that were experiencing this but weren't coming to our pantry. So we set up this text blast and it reached a whole number of people that thought, oh, that's not there for me. And now they know and it's making a difference in their in their lives. Um, and in terms of volunteering, and I know Randy's going to add more, um, but I just wanted to say that reach out to, I mean, we have on our website, you know, people can certainly sign up to volunteer, but reach out to the pantry in one's community and find out what does that pantry need. It could be setting up meals, but it also could be helping build a ramp. It could be helping build a community garden, unpacking um, deliveries. It could be using computer skills. And as, as Randy mentioned earlier, do you speak an Eng a language other than English? Can you help translate a menu into Spanish or Arabic or whatever is most frequently spoken in your community? So I just wanted to put a plug in for that. Um, thanks. Absolutely. Randy? Sure. We talk often about that how there's many ways to give. And we talk about, obviously, people know about financial donations, which we'll gladly take. Um, but people can also give their time, as Kathleen said. And then I do also want to point out giving your voice. So most people who work for nonprofits want to work themselves out of a job. And I firmly believe that food banks shouldn't exist. I think we're here to fill a gap. And part of our role is also to eliminate that gap. And being a, an informed advocate and, and working with elected officials to educate them on, on the issue and the need is, is also an essential part of our mission. Um, so 
the best place to, to find out how to get more involved is definitely our website at www.foodbankst.org. Um, but I also want to make sure folks know about the resource 211. 211 is a helpline that you can pick up a telephone and dial 211, just like you're calling 911, but it, it will go to 211. And they can either help you find a place to volunteer, but if you're also needing assistance, they can connect you to resources. So that's a really great one-stop shop of either getting more involved or, or getting assistance that you might need. And I do just want to echo what Kathleen said, is we're really trying to change the narrative that the, the food pantries and the, the assistance is only for certain people or people that are really, really struggling. It is there for anybody. And any of us could be at any moment needing some help. And then maybe in a few months, we don't need that help, or maybe we still do. Um, but yeah, we have heard that, that people are like, I, I could use the help, but I, I'm worried I'm taking it from someone else that needs it. And that is not the case. There is enough for everybody. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And, uh, you know, e even for me and in, in what I do, I, I, I need to sound that uh, more often also, that it, that it is open for everyone. It's just not something we do for someone else all the time, but other people can uh, can be, a, 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 it can benefit from that also. I just want to take this time to to thank you both uh, for taking your time, uh, not only just in, in, in this uh, brief moment, but in everything that you do uh, every day with the food bank. It is very, very much appreciated, um, it, especially, and again, I'll go, I'll go back to my roles as pastor to know that this kind of support exists in Broome County. And so I really, truly, it, from the bottom of my heart, uh, I don't do, do this very often in interviews, but I, I, I do really want to thank you for what you both are doing and, and, and your whole team. So thank you. I appreciate it. Friends, we've had the honor and the privilege uh, to speak with Randy Quackenbush, uh, the Director of the Community Impact, and also Kathleen Pacetti, the Program and Partnership Coordinator for Broome and Tompkins County, with our work with the Food Bank of the Southern Tier. So please get involved any way that you can. Go to their website and get all the information and, and help. Um, help them help others uh, by promoting this uh, wherever you can, however you can. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, we hope you have a blessed day and stay safe. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you.